series for our biomanufacturing program at Laney College. Uh, we started doing these this semester and obviously in response to the shelter in place and lockdown, but um, we have in our program just over the years uh, invited industry experts to come and speak to students in the biomanufacturing program at Laney to bring in their expertise and expose students to what's going on in the cutting edge of the field of biomanufacturing. Um, so, and if you want to learn more about our program and you're uh, here just exploring it, you can look us up online. Of course, we're at Laney uh, Biomanufacturing. Just look up Laney College Biomanufacturing online. You'll find us. This talk is being recorded and we will uh, post this afterwards. You'll have access to it so you can follow along if you missed anything. Also, if you have any questions during the talk, feel free to use the uh, chat function or um, uh, yeah, put your questions in the chat or raise your hand using the little raise hand uh, emoji or whatever. Um, there are two uh, TAs on the on the chat here that will be able to alert us to um, incoming questions. So just put them in the chat. All right, um, I would like to introduce uh, Jean-Philippe Prawl, who is a senior uh, bioprocess researcher at the Advanced biofuel process demonstration units, uh, ABPDU. I think the name's changed a little bit, but that's how I've called it. Um, <laughs> ABPDU, which is in Emeryville here in California in the Bay Area. And ABPDU is a contract manufacturing unit, uh, part of the DOE, Department of Energy Labs. Um, they do work for all kinds of companies and, and John Philippe or JP will tell us a lot about that today. Um, he's also going to go through mainly the talk will focus on downstream processing. And so this times really well with what we're talking about in our bio 79 class. So the you from bio 79 on the call, um, we're now covering the downstream processing section. So one of the reasons why I invited uh, JP is that um, we're very closely um, allied with ABPDU, our program is, and we have longstanding connections going back many years. Many, many of our students have worked at ABPDU, um, and uh, they <clears throat> have provided a lot of expertise and help for us. But he, um, I actually asked JP to help us out with a particular issue we're having now in our lab, which is how to purify a particular protein that we're working with. So one of the things that I hope to get out of this talk is uh, improving kind of our options on how we're going to purify some of the proteins we're working with in our program, like the high fidelity polymerase that we're currently producing. So uh, with that introduction, I will let uh, JP take it away. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Doc. Uh, can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Yes. Great. Okay. So yeah, thank, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really glad to be here and to uh, talk to you all. Um, I prepared a presentation um, and I called it Practical Insights from a Pilot Plant because this is where I'm working. I'm working at the ABPDU, as Doug mentioned. Um, we are located in Emeryville and have a little bit of an introduction um, about what we do and um, our capabilities. Um, and I thought maybe it's great to couple like um, the, the theoretical insight that you got from lectures and with practical insights. And um, I will be focusing on cell separation and uh, protein purification. And um, this is my outline. So I will uh, give a little bit of an introduction about myself, about the APDU. And then I will talk about the relationship of upstream and downstream industri and industrial biotechnology. And then I will go into a deep dive into um, how I call it basic DSP, downstream unit operations. And I will walk you through a food protein example. Um, and the three unit operations are uh, cell separation through centrifugation, um, protein concentration through um, tangential flow filtration, and more specifically, ultrafiltration. And then the third unit operation is very similar to the um, protein concentration, but it's called uh, diafiltration, and it also uses tangential flow filtration. And more specifically, this is ultrafiltration, diafiltration, but I will um, go into more details later. Um, I just want to let you know that this is a very detailed, very long presentation. Um, there will be um, lots, like, some calculations, lots of numbers, um, lots of like pictures, information. So um, if you don't catch everything on the first go, don't worry about it. We will share the slides. Um, we will have the recordings. 
You can send emails later. Um, so yeah, I just want you guys to have a good time. Um, so about myself, I'm, um, I'm originally from Northern Germany. I was born in Braunschweig and raised in Bremen. This is in North Germany. And then I attended, um, I did my bachelor's and master's degree in biotechnology at um, a technical university in Braunschweig. And then I did an internship at JBay, the Joint Bioenergy Institute at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in, in Emeryville. And then I moved downstairs, quote unquote, because JBay is on the fourth floor and the AVPDU is on the third floor in the same building. And um, we interacted quite a lot during my internship and then everybody, or we thought it would be a great idea if I would start working here full time. So this was um, early 2017. I started as a process engineer and now I'm a senior process engineer. And I've been working at the APU for the last three years. And on the bottom, you can see um, some pictures um, on the bottom left. This is the Christmas market in Bremen, my hometown. And then in the middle, you can see the Technical University. And obviously on the right, you can see the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, this is the building. Um, we are yeah, a pilot plant in Emeryville on the third floor. And we share the building with J-Bay, with Emerys, with Bayer. And um, yeah, and we are also in the building, obviously. Um, what does the ABPDU do? So the ABPDU is um, sort of a research incubator slash accelerator. So we work with industry companies, we work with research labs, with universities um, to commercialize the technology or to do scale up work. And the scale up work could be in, uh, in the field of uh, biomass pretreatment, but it could also be in fermentation or um, purification. And in many cases, we do all of the above in one project. And um, the equipment that we have is pretty expensive, lots of stainless steel. So for example, in the, in the top middle picture, this is our ABEC 300 liter fermenter. This costs, um, I think, like $1 million per piece. And we have three of those. And then um, next to this picture, we have like a whole, like a lot going on. This, uh, on the top left, there's like a pressure vessel that we use for biomass pretreatment. And we have an extraction column on the on the right. So I don't want to go into a whole lot of details, but um, basically the takeaway is that our facility has a lot of expensive equipment that um, early stage biotech companies would not be able to afford. And certainly universities, um, they don't also they don't generate the quantities of material that would justify buying these of these kind of equipments. Um, so you see, um, we have a certain role that we play in the biotech um, environment. So um, there's on the top left, you can see there's research and development. This is usually on milliliters or maybe um, liter scale. And then there's um, the pilot scale, which can go from let's say 50 to 1000 liters. And then there is um, demonstra demonstration scale and commercial scale, which go up to um, hundreds of thousands of liters. And you can see the ABPDU is somewhere in the middle um, where we do early stage um, process development and scale up. Just to give you a, a little bit of an overview of what we are doing. This is the team. So um, we have around 20 people, um, people working in like with, with engineering background, with biology background, chemical, um, like elect, uh, analytical chemistry and business develop, development, all kinds of folks. And if you're interested, um, we give tours on a regular basis. Um, so just send me an email. My email is on the bottom. Um, that's it about the, the APDU. Um, now I'm going to talk about, um, yeah, give a little bit of an introduction to biotechnology, industrial biotechnology in particular, and um, yeah, the relationship of um, upstream and downstream processing. Um, so on this slide, I want to make the point that biotechnology is very diverse. We have industrial biotech and we have, um, I call it cell culture and pharmaceutical biotech, but then there's also ag biotech, all kinds of different biotechnologies. Um, but today we're focusing on the industrial biotech. And um, what does it mean, industrial biotech? So for me, industrial biotech means that we, like, um, we work with a lot of microbes, with bacteria, yeast, fungi, and algae, and we make a low to mid value products, um, for example, fuels and chemicals, 
That doesn't mean that these products are not useful at all. It just means that the, the, um, the value per kilogram is relatively low. So we're talking about one to two dollars per kilogram. And um, in order to make the economics work, you have to go to very large scales. So um, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of liters of fermentation capacity. Um, on the bottom, you can see a picture of a plant. I think this is um, Amaris's plant in Brazil. A huge plant, lots of stainless steel, very expensive. I'm, I don't, I'm not sure about the numbers exactly, but it's something in the neighborhood of like $350 million. So it's a lot of money. Um, and then also for me, industrial biotech means that we, have, we are working on campaigns that last around like five to seven days. We're working in a clean environment as opposed to a completely sterile environment. And we have relatively um, high flexibility in terms of um, regulations and paperwork. And I'm saying this in res with respect to cell culture and pharmaceutical work because there, there like different rules apply this. Lots of paperwork, lots of documentation. The value of the product is usually higher. Um, the fermentation capacity is a little bit lower and the, um, the campaigns last usually weeks and not days. And the reason is because the mammalian cells or insect cells, they grow very slowly. And um, yeah, so I'm, in the beginning, I just wanted to let you know um, what I understand under industrial biotechnology. Um, this is a picture that I like. Um, it's, um, I don't know where this was taken, but it's, you can obviously, you can see two stainless steel fermenter. I would um, estimate that it's around 60,000 liters uh, fermenter in size, and it's multiple stories. Um, so industrial biotech for me means that you use biology and engineering and you make cool stuff out of it. Um, and then one example of this cool stuff uh, can be seen in our um, Berkeley Lab feature that we put out not too long ago. Um, the APDU collaborated with a company called Checkerspot and they use uh, microalgae to make um, oils and they can polymerize these oils and make um, high value products and um, like polymers, like skis, for example. So their first product is a ski. And uh, later when we have our break, um, we can actually uh, check out this video that they put out on YouTube and um, we can talk a little bit more about their technology. And yeah, this is, I think, like a really cool example of um, biotechnology. Um, real quick, upstream or the fermentation, what does it mean? So um, for me, the upstream um, part of the process is where you produce your target molecule. And there are a wide variety of um, hosts and products. Usually they're called commodity products. So you have to go really large scale, what I said earlier. And if you look at the entire cost of your bioprocess, which is upstream and downstream, the fermentation part is usually around 30 to 45% of the total production cost. Um, that tells me that there's like, it's a decent amount of chunk of money, but it's not the, the lion's share. Um, and we will talk about um, what, what is, um, yeah, what part of the process is more expensive than fermentation. Um, so what does the fermentation involve? Usually you have a stock culture, then you go into shake flask, you go into seed fermenter, you sterilize the media, you add media, and then you go into a production fermenter. And depending on your process, or maybe also the stage of your company, this could be a two liter bioreactor, but it could also be a 500,000 liter bioreactor. But the scheme, the, the diagram looks very similar for uh, most fermentation um, processes. Um, for industrial biotechnology, there are three process metrics that are very important. This is the TRI or TRI, the titer, um, which is gram of product per liter, um, the rate, the productivity, and the yield. And these three parameters um, yeah, determine how, how valuable or how, how viable is your um, fermentation process. So for example, the titer gives you um, a good indication of how expensive your purification will be. The rate will give you um, how efficiently or how high uh, is the turnaround of your equipment. Let's say if you have a bioreactor, it takes, um, the process takes five days. 
and you can probably run one fermentation per week. But if your process takes two weeks, then you can, yeah, you have only, um, you can only run one fermentation in, in two weeks, whereas in the earlier example, you can run two fermentations in two weeks. Um, and then we have the yield, and this really gives you indication of how much money you have to spend on the feedstock, on the raw material. And there's a rule of thumb for commercialization. Um, your process for industrial biotech should be around 100 grams per liter at a one grams per liter an hour rate and a yield around 85% uh, of the maximum theoretical yield. And this is very important for industrial biotech and pharmaceutical industry. You can get away with much lower try metrics because um, your product is so much more valuable. So I think we're talking about like hundreds or even thousands of dollars per kilogram, whereas in industrial biotech, it's more like one or two dollars per kilogram. So you see there's a huge difference there. Um, oh yeah, and then the picture on the right, this is our um, ABEC 300 liter fermenter that we have in the lab. Um, we opened the lid and you can see the impeller in the middle and then you can see some flow breakers and the um, acid and like some other addition ports on the top. Um, downstream processing, um, this is really where you do, uh, where you worry about the purification of your target molecule that you generate in the, in the fermentation. Um, usually it's not one unit operation, but it's a series of units operation. And um, I usually uh, like to think about um, downstream processing in terms of there's like some basic unit operations that you always do, or in most um, bioprocesses like cell separation, you always use cells, you always need to get rid of the cells. Maybe the cell is your product or your, um, your cells are the byproduct or like even waste. But at some point, you just have to get rid of the biomass and, um, and yeah, to, to do the cell separation. And usually, you do that through centrifugation, but you can also do it through um, membrane filtration. But this is maybe for another talk. And then there are more um, specialized unit operations, for example, spray drying or um, some other unit operation that you would not use for, um, or only for, like, special units um, or for special processes. Um, so for example, we don't have a spray dryer at APU because we can get away without. Um, it would be nice to have one, but um, there's no way that we can operate without a centrifuge. Um, and the cost of the downstream of the total production cost is around 55 to 70 percent. And this is because you have a series of unit operations and um, yeah, um, so it's very expensive to run these different unit operations. And here I have a good news for you. So um, most uh, or almost any molecule can be purified. That's the good news. The bad news is that um, doing it economically is very difficult. Um, and because downstream is very expensive. So um, the piece of equipment that you have run in series are very expensive. So for example, um, our distax centrifuge, I believe is like something around $150,000. And then you have to have people who actually know how to run the centrifuge. They have to uh, know how to operate it, but then also um, they have to clean it and maintain it. So there we go, it's lots of labor involved. And then every unit operations has also um, involved some losses. So, Ideally, you could cut out some of the unit operations and make the process leaner. Basically, you cut out unit operation and, you, and then you would save a lot of money. So um, I guess the main takeaway is the fewer unit operations, the better. But of course, you want your product to be in a um, high purity. And um, so I guess you have to run as many unit operations as necessary. But um, you don't want to run um, more than necessary, I guess, because it's expensive. Um, yeah, with DSP, um, nobody wants to do it, but you have to do it. Um, also, DSP is never perfect. You will always have losses during unit operations. And this is my rule of thumb. Usually when you run a unit operation, you will always, um, yeah, like basically the best you can do is 70 to 90% recovery. So let's say if you start with 100 grams of material, and you do the distax centrifugation, then afterwards you end up with 70 to 90 gram, depending on how well the separation works. And sometimes you just don't know, will it work out at all? Will it work out well or um, not so well? So it's always a little bit of a black box. 
but yeah, you can always expect losses. And also, um, usually DSP is where the wheels come off when it comes to commercialization. Um, this is actually a criticism that many people have because um, many research labs or companies, they focus, they focus on making the molecule, but they never think about how to purify it. Um, so there's an argument to be made that maybe people should, should start with the, um, with the end in mind where they say, okay, hey, which molecule is actually valuable and can be um, easily purified? And then once they identify the molecule, then they can worry about the, the fermentation. But usually it's the other way around. Um, so a commercially viable process requires a high fermentation production metrics, the trimetrics that I, I mentioned earlier, it has to be efficient and a very low cost DSP. And usually I see um, the upstream and down, downstream process as one unit, as one unity, a unit, because um, many things that you do upstream in the fermentation will directly affect the downstream processing. For example, if you run the fermentation, you have lots of foaming, you can easily get rid of the foaming by ad adding anti-foam, <clears throat> like a silicone-based anti-foam or something else. And then you will get rid of the foaming, but then you will basically kick the can down the road because the DSP team will now have to worry about it. And usually this is a joke that I like to do. What do DSP people do? And they yell at the fermentation team because <laughs> we added the anti-foam and now they have to um, figure out how to get rid of it. And especially anti-foam is very annoying to get rid because it causes membrane fouling. I will talk about later what that is. They're really challenging. Sometimes you have to add extra unit operation just to get rid of this one uh, molecule like um, component that you added. And it's very costly. Um, so again, upstream and downstream is one process and I would argue they are married. Um, this is another example that basically um, should highlight the, uh, the unity of the two. So um, for example, if you think of the raw materials, they're very costly and usually you run um, like glucose as a starting as a carbon source that you use to convert into um, your target molecule and usually the, um, the raw materials yeah, are up to 40 percent of the variable cost um, of the process and the problem is that high purity sugar is very expensive so here you can see 0.33 dollars per kilogram um, and if you have, you want one kilogram of your product, your yield is 0.5 grams per gram, then you need two kilograms of sugar to make this one kilogram of product. And if you just look at the raw material cost, it's uh, 0.66 dollars per, um, just yeah, the, the cost that you spend on feedstock to get this one kilogram of product out. So if your product is only worth $1 per kilogram, then you're not going anywhere, right? So this is exactly the problem um, what many industrial biotech companies have that their product is not super valuable and sometimes or many times they compete with um, oil because oil is a very um, cheap resource especially these days um, so the biofuel example if you have um, you want to pay four dollars per gallon this is roughly one dollar per kilogram then based on the calculation that are provided up above um, you have to spend like 0.66 dollars on um, just on raw materials, which is very expensive. So um, bottom line, there's like a pressure to bring the production cost down. And one way to do it is to buy cheaper and less pure sugar. And um, the most common form of cheap and less pure sugar is glucose 95 DE. And you see it's cheaper, but it's not that much cheaper. So it's 0.2 dollars per kilogram. Uh, the problem is that it has lots of um, impurities and the impurities are mostly um, unfermentable sugars like maltose and maybe some, um, I don't even know, other sugars that your microbes can eat. And so they remain in the fermentation broth and they cause problems with the separation, they uh, caramelize, they cause membrane fouling, or just um, they, color, they cause a strange color during the fermentation. If you have like a cosmetic product and you have some weird yellowish color in your product, you don't want to put this on your face, right? So people have to um, get the impurities out. And this is very expensive. So again, it's um, yeah, another example um, why upstream and downstream must be regarded as one process. 
Uh, next, I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, I came up with a um, fictional example process that we ran in a similar way at the APDU. Because of um, IP concerns, I can disclose um, details or I can disclose um, the exact same process. But I tried to make um, the process as realistic as possible. And I, I would argue for you, it doesn't matter if it's a fictional process or not. So um, I came up with a company name. It's called Biosynthetica. It's a startup in the East Bay in California. They use um, Baker's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae to make a food protein one, or they call it FP1. It's a 20 kilodalton um, molecular weight protein, and it's one dollar per kilogram. So it's a commodity um, product. And the reason why this company comes to us at the APDU is because they want to generate one kilogram of purified product so that they can use it to do some, um, yeah, they can ship it out to potential collaborators. They can do some product testing, some tastings even. Um, and they want to develop their DSP process at pilot scale. So they have, the company has some uh, bench scale equipment. They have some um, filtration units, but um, they want to, for the first time, want to run um, pilot scale equipment. And that's one of the reasons why they came to us. Um, so since this talk focuses on DSP, I will skip the fermentation process. And basically we, we are fasting, fast forwarding to the end of the fermentation we do the harvest. We have um, a 20 grams per liter product titer. Um, we have um, a 0.33 grams per liter per hour productivity. And the yield is also um, lower than 85%. Um, so we can uh, summarize that the, the tri metrics are not enough to be a commercially viable process. Um, but that's okay because this company is pretty early stage. They just want to generate material they want to generate um, data on the purification. And their goal is just to um, yeah, recover one kilogram of pu uh, highly purified material. And if you look at the, if we do in back of the envelope calculation, based on the material that we harvested, this is broth, um, 280 kilograms. And if you do the math, roughly 280 liters or kilograms, because the density is one, times um, the, the protein titer, we get up to 5.6 kilograms of protein that we could, in theory, recover. So um, me, as a process engineer, I see these numbers and I'm happy because I see the collaboration um, objective is reachable or achievable. Um, but now, if you want to look more into details, um, we want to um, scrutinize the, uh, the back of the envelope calculation a little bit. And we do a reality, reality check. How much protein can we actually recover? And here it's um, interesting because we measure the, the protein titer in grams per liter. We measure it in the supernatant and not in the whole broth. So now we have to ask the question, we know the titer, but we need to know how much supernatant do we actually have? And supernatant, you can see on this diagram on the top right, fermentation broth that you harvest um, goes into two streams. One is the cell sludge and one is a supernatant. And if we do a simple spin test on the benchtop centrifuge, where we um, use a 10, 50 mil falcon tube, we add, 50, we add 10 milliliter of fermentation broth. We spin it at maximum speed for let's say five minutes. Then you see the cells will separate out on the bottom and we have supernatant floats on the top. And then if we do the simple math, we, we start with 10 mils of material we got two milliliters of cells and eight milliliters of supernatant. So we, we know that we have 20% uh, solids and 80% supernatant. And so we have to modify our calculation a little bit. So we use the 280 liters multiplied by 80%, then times the titer, and then we get to a more realistic number, which is 4.5 kilograms of protein that we can actually recover, which is substantially less than our back of the envelope calculation. Um, one thing on, this, on the cells, I um, labeled this as waste, but I guess a fully integrated process later at commercial scale, they will also have to find use for the cells. Um, so even though maybe at this stage they will toss it and they won't um, regard it as valuable material right now, 
at commercial scale, they will probably want to do something with it. Either they want to burn it to get energy or they use it as a cattle feed um, so that they generate some additional value, like in another, in another value stream. Um, now I want to talk about the cell separation at pilot scale through um, centrifugation. And on the left, you can see this is our continuous disk stack centrifuge. And on the right, you see our 300 liter fermenter. And the continuous disk stack centrifuge is a very um, versatile equipment. It's very common in industry and it's mostly used for um, cell separation in biotech. And um, here is another picture. And then I guess what I want to yeah, tell you that it's used for solid liquid separation and the, the maximum separation efficiency that we can get is 75%. So this reiterates a little bit what I was saying earlier that the separation is never perfect. You will always have some losses and um, I will talk about it later what that means in more detail. Um, so this is a um, animated picture of the distax centrifuge. Um, and you can see um, the bowl is filling up with, with your cell material with your um, fermentation broth. It's spinning at very high speed. Our centrifuge runs at 9,000 RPM, which is around um, 10,000 times G-force. And um, basically the, the continuous disk stack centrifuge, as the name suggests, runs continuously. So you, we are feeding the cell broth continuously in. We're getting the supernatant out continuously as well. But then at some point, the bowl will fill up with solids, as you can see here in this animation. And then we have to figure out, we have to calculate um, actually how long does it take to fill the bowl up. Because if we um, discharge every three to five minutes, if we discharge too early, um, we are um, we have more losses because the let's say the um, the solid percentage in the discharge is less than the targeted seventy five percent. So it's let's say we um, we don't do any optimization, we end up at um, fifty percent solids in the discharge. Over time, we do let's say one hundred discharge for the entire run. Then you have like um, a considerable amount of losses that you could avoid if you do a proper um, process optimization. So yeah, we have to calculate how long does it take to fill the bowl. And this is really um, a function of how fast are we pumping in your, our um, cell broth and how high is the solid percentage in our feed is how we call it. And this is the flow diagram. We have the fermenter. We pump it into the disk stack. Um, we get the continuous stream, the supernatant out. We collect it into a holding tank, in a stainless steel holding tank. And we call it light phase or cell-free supernatant. And it's um, cell-free is not the right term because there's always some kind of carryover, but it's less than, let's say, 0.1% if you do it right. So I call it now cell-free supernatant. And then we have the, um, the, the cell sludge, the heavy phase gets spit out every yeah, three to five minutes and then we collect it into a solid carboy. And again, I label this as waste here. Uh, this is the setup, how it actually looks at the APDU. Uh, you have the fermenter on the right, then you harvest it you, through the pump. The pump sends the material into the disk stack. The disk stack sends it into the um, stainless steel holding tank and then the cells get um, discharged into a carboy that you can't really see here. And then just to throw out a couple of numbers. So we harvest 280 liters or kilograms of whole broth. Then we will, I estimated we get something in the neighborhood between 190 liters and 202 liters of supernatant. Um, the supernatant has 20-ish grams per liter of your proteins. It has, most of it is water. We have salt and other proteins that we all need to get rid of later. And then we have the, um, the heavy phase, which is 60 to 90 liters. Most of these cells, um, depending on how good the separation is, 30 to 75%. Again, we have supernatant as losses. We have protein, salt, and other proteins. Um, before we run the centrifuge, we have to ask ourselves a couple of questions. One is, how big are the solids that we are separating out? And um, on the top right, you can see comparison with yeast, Saccharomyces, and the bacteria, for example, E. coli. And there's a considerable uh, difference in size. And usually, larger solids separate out much better than smaller solids. 
So um, based on my experience, I can tell if someone said, okay, we want to do this sex centrifuge, we're running this yeast organism, then I'm kind of relieved or happy because I know the separation will probably work out fine uh, because it's yeast and not bacteria or some other slimy uh, microorganism. And then we have to ask ourselves, how much solids do we have? And um, again, we de determine the solid content through a benchtop um, spin test. And based on this test, uh, we identify that we got 20% volume by volume solid percentage. And um, this, these two parameters um, determine how long does it actually take to process 280 liters of material. Um, and usually it's around like five to six hours where like three people stand in the lab, they run the disk stack, they turn around samples, they make sure that the quality is right. Um, yeah, oh yeah, and then real quick, the solid content determines how often do you fill up the bowl, the disk stack bowl, or in other words, how many discharges do we need to do, and the particle size determines the separation efficiency. Um, this is a Excel spreadsheet that we use to calculate how long does um, it take to fill the bowl with solids. And we just plug in the numbers that we got. So um, the cell, the feed, solids content is 20%. Um, I, as an operator, I want the discharge timing to be around five minutes because we need to do some quality uh, checks while we're running the centrifuge. And if the, the discharge intervals every minute, then we, we can process the samples fast enough um, before we get the, the fresh sample. So within five minutes, you can um, turn around samples very nicely. Um, and then we have, um, yeah, the separation target, in this case, 75%. Maybe you could go higher a little bit, but then once the cell sludge gets too thick, um, it's very problematic to pump it out. So then they will, it will plug the disk stack centrifuge and then at some point, um, yeah, the whole process will fail. So that's why we, we target 75% because we know uh, the material can still be evacuated um, very nicely. Um, and then, yeah, after we plug in all these numbers, we calculate the flow rate that we, um, that we want to run the pump at. And this is the equation that we use for that. So maybe later, if you have time, you can have a look at it in more detail. Um, okay, during the run, I mentioned already, we take samples and we want to determine how good is the separation. And on the, on the right, you can see two examples. On the top, you have a very good separation where you have a clear supernatant, which is good because you don't want a cell carryover or only very small amounts. And you have a very high solid content in the heavy phase. This is the right, the brown tube. So you see there's um, a large content of cells and then there's some clear liquid on the top. This is how, what I would call a good separation. Then on the bottom you have, um, again, a clear supernatant, which is great, but then you have 50% solids in, in the, the tube on the right. And this is something that we, um, that, that we can live with, but ideally you want to bring up the solid content. And I will tell you in a second how we do that. Um, so yeah, during the run, I realized, okay, we have only 50% solids. Uh, we can do better than that. We need to do some uh, process parameter tuning. And um, how do we do that? Usually, um, like we have these two parameters, which is the discharge interval time and the flow rate. And these two can be changed so that you, um, you make more efficient use of your discharge interval or your, um, your, your bowl volume, basically. And if we say we, we um, leave the discharge interval constant and we just do some fiddling with the flow rate, then you can usually get a really good result in terms of process optimization. So here you can see these tubes on the very left, we have a really horrible separation. It's like, what, 30% solids and we're wasting a lot of supernate in here. And then we increase the flow rate from 0.9 liters per minute gradually, step by step. And then we uh, eventually we ended up at 1.25 liters per minute, again, at the constant interval time. And then we were able to bring up the solid content to 75% where we want it to be. Um, so this is a really good separation after the run. And um, yeah, 
basically we improve recovery and we have fewer losses. And this is exactly what our client is interested in. Um, after the centrifugation, we do a mass balance. So um, we write down all the, the materials that we started with, and then we write down the material that we ended up with. So in this case, we started with 200 kilo, 280 kilograms of material. Um, we recovered around 190 kilograms of supernatant with like just a little bit of cells. Don't worry about it for now. And then we have 90 kilograms of heavy phase. And the heavy phase contained 62% of solids based on a spin test that we did. And um, now the question is, why, do we, why don't we have the 75% as targeted? And the reason is because we started off with suboptimal conditions in the beginning. Um, we had to optimize. This takes time. Sometimes it takes like one or two hours to figure out the right um, process parameters. And then if you think about like, the process, the total process, maybe five hours, so then you have a considerable amount of time like where you uh, run under suboptimal conditions. So basically, the 62% in the heavy phase that we harvested is just the average of the poor um, separation that we got in the end and the good separation that we got at, uh, in the beginning and the good separation that we got at the end. Um, yeah, so now another reality check. Now we can say, okay, we have 190 liters of sup supernatant. We do the math and then we, we, we get 3.8 kilograms of soluble protein. Um, which is less than we anticipated. And we can say that we lost 15.2% of proteins just in this one unit operation, the cell separation. And um, the best possible outcome, if we had immediately nailed the conditions to 75%, then we would have got 8.3% losses. So again, Recovery is never perfect. You will always have losses. And the goal is really to minimize the losses as much as possible. Um, now, the next chapter would be the, um, the purification through um, like the, the tangential flow filtration. But I thought maybe we take a little bit of a break because it's a little bit much of information. And maybe I can show you um, the video of the checker spot collaboration. And then right afterwards, we will dive into the um, membrane filtration. Doc, how does it sound to you? Oh, that sounds great. Cool. Awesome. So let me pull up the video. Um, so yeah, oh, there we go. Um, so what I mentioned earlier, Checker Spot is the company in, in, in Emeryville slash Berkeley, and they make these skis based on um, yeah, oils that they make with algae. And the um, collaboration that we did was like, we worked with this company for the last three years. We have done 10 300 liter campaigns already. It's a very nice relationship. And now finally they got their first product on the market. And the Lawrence Berkeley lab uh, was really excited about it. And they um, published a feature on it, which includes like an, a press release, like an article. And also um, we did this video that I wanted to show you. If we look at the history of materials innovation and materials development, it is characterized by what has been available at large commodity scale. But it's been a function of what's been available and not thinking about product design and product development through the lens of how can we make a better material? How can we make a better thing that improves the performance of that product, that makes it a better experience for the consumer? Our algal oils are one of the key components of this polymer. And so there's a whole world of formulation that we can do. We can take these polyols and use those in a variety of different formulations to make something like this, which is a high density foam, something you might find in our ski product, for example. Biology unlocks this potential to enable a more intentional design of materials. And the ABPDU is instrumental in our being able to show at a larger scale that we can do this in pilot scale fermentation capacity. The equipment you see here in the lab costs millions of dollars. We need the utilities, the expertise to use that. 
if you're scaling something up and you don't know it's going to work, it's a huge risk to invest in that equipment. So the nice thing that we can do at AVPDU is we can get people in here, they can de-risk their technology, then they can either directly commercialize that, or they can go back in and purchase the equipment themselves to get it right after they've de-risked it, after they've gotten that next round of funding, and then they can scale with confidence. Most consumers associate petroleum, whether that is things like polyester or nylon, as being high performance products. But if we can get to those materials, or if we can get to totally new classes of materials based on things that come from biology, where we don't have to extract crude oil, or where the agricultural practices are much better, if we can do that in a more thoughtful and responsible way, that's better for people and it's better for the planet, that's a great thing. Okay, I think the quality was a little bit bad, right? <laughs> Were you able to see it? Yeah, I was able to see it, just the video was a little choppy, but it was fine. Right, okay. So I will provide the link. Um, you can have a look at it later if you want. Um, but I thought it would maybe nice just to see the lab and um, to see what biology is capable of. Do you want to keep going or do you want to take a five minute break? How is everybody feeling? I, I um, think we, oh, go ahead. Sorry. This is Jen, hi, hi. Um, can we take a break, five minutes? Sure. Okay, thank you. Well, while we're in this uh, five minute break, I thought I could ask a couple of questions anyway, because I'm sure people are listening in. Um, JP, if you don't mind. Go for it. Cool. Um, so I was just wondering at ABPDU, um, you mentioned the 20 gram per liter kind of assumption and protein concentration. Um, how are you determining that? So which, what type of assays do you use to verify or validate your protein concentrations at different steps? Mm -hmm. So usually, um, since we run these processes for um, companies, they usually run their own assays at their own site. Um, because otherwise there would be another tech transfer needed to onboard the analytical techniques. And sometimes there's also a hiccup and then you don't really know, uh, can I trust this value? What if it's 20% higher? Does it mean we, we did 20% better or maybe just the analytics are off? And since we're local, um, most companies prefer to do it at their site. That being said, we can also do it. And sometimes if we have a really long standing project, then we do also method onboarding. And then we would either develop a, a HPLC method or it could be um, just running SDH page, SDH page so that we can get a visual confirmation like, hey, okay, this worked pretty well and we have proteins mm -hmm. or like a Bradford essay. Um, yeah, there are multiple ways to, um, to quantify the protein. Um, but yeah, again, mostly companies would like to do that themselves. I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the other question I had was um, you went to the DSC step. I was wondering prior to that, um, what do you do for typically for cell disruption if you have a internally manufactured product inside the cell? That's right, great question. So we have a homogenizer and high pressure homogenizer, which um, is great for proof of concept, but it's too small. The throughput is too low to run 300 liter of material through it. And most companies, um, if they're not pharmaceutical companies, they prefer to um, have processes that are not involving um, intracellular products. Because, yeah, it adds another step of unit operation. And then also you, you basically completely um, yeah, destroy the cells. And then you have all the cell debris in, inside your fermentation broth with all the proteins that you want to uh, purify. So it's, it becomes actually more and more messy and if people can avoid it, they would want to avoid intracellular pro products. That said, pharmaceutical in industry, for them, it's a whole different ball game. Um, they can just run actor protein chromatography and they, um, yeah, they don't care as much about it. Um, but yeah, method of choice is usually extracellular. So would you say most of the companies that are using microbes that you guys work with are do, uh, finding a secreting pathway for their organism? Mm -hmm. That's right, yeah. 
unless they are still in the development stage. So sometimes like we have a company uh, close by, they still don't know what their um, final product will look like. They have an idea, but then they test different, um, yeah, yeah. they do protein engineering and they want to test as many um, yeah, different products as possible. And, and then they, the, easy, the easiest platform is E. coli IPDG expression. And then they just churn it out. They, they do some product testing. And then once they identified the protein, protein that they are actually interested in, then they will probably switch hosts to another system that excretes the protein. Yeah, just because the cost is so much higher. Professor, uh, please, how long is Go. the lecture going to last? Oh, uh, uh, it'll probably, I think we're, what, halfway through right now, JP, right? Is that correct? Or? Yeah, mm -hmm. I think I could probably make um, yeah, 515, 520. Okay, I'm just taking it by my next, my next class. Thank you. And sorry, do you guys have a, a space for inter? For internships, yeah, we do have it. Yeah, actually, Jenny, she was or uh, yeah was an intern here over the last months. Um, so we do internships. Mm -hmm. Okay. So can you send? Can you give us a uh, like? Can you attach the email of you can send the CV to the slide? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, thank you. Also, um, Doug is very well connected with the leadership here at the APDU. So okay. um, it would be easy to make the connection. Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions out there before we restart? We're about at the five minute mark here for our break. Yeah, hi, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Wait, go ahead, Lily. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, so you were mentioning about sort of like having efficiency for running the, um, running, um, the, you know, most efficient number of products through, uh, does that mean your, is your lab one of the labs that works for like 24 hours a day, every day, as long as you have a project or do you do shifts? Right. So we do shift work. We are usually running, um, like nine to five actually, but then if the client requests it, we can do six to 10 PM. Um, mm -hmm. We have done some graveyard shift, but this is very rare and we really don't want to do that because we are just a team of um, 20 people. Only let's say half of the, half of the team works actually in the lab. So it's very challenging to accommodate 24 seven. Okay. Thank you. But as you go up in scale, um, you will find that most pilot units or uh, demonstration labs or commercial facilities, they run 24 seven because every single process is actually way too expensive to leave it unmonitored. Here at 300 liter scale, we can get away <laughs> with um, no monitoring <laughs> overnight. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Great, so uh, JP, would you like to carry on? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, um, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, we started off with 280 kilograms of cell material. We, we ran it through the distax centrifuge. We got rid of the cells. We had some losses. We don't worry about those for now. And now we have uh, 190 kilograms um, of supernatant that has 20 grams per liter of protein or 3.8 kilograms um, of total protein. Now we want to... Um, reduce the volume of the material. So um, we have yeah, 190 liters and we wanted to bring it down to uh, 19 liters. And we do that through a tangential flow filtration. And um, the key, the magic here is we're gonna remove basically like liquid or like buffer solution while we are retaining the target protein. And um, by doing that, we remove the volume, the amount of protein stays the same and so um, what we get is like an increase in protein titer by 10x as we're going down in volume by 10x. Um, so yeah, there's the math. Protein is constant, volume goes down, protein concentration goes up. And in the beginning, we have uh, 190 liters in this stainless steel holding tank on the top. And then later we concentrate down the volume and it fits nicely into this um, little cowboy right here. And um, the 
uh, tangential flow filtration can be done through um, a variety of unit operations. One could be a spiral round membrane filtration that you see on the, on the left. Um, this is our, um, we call it M20 spiral unit, <clears throat> where you have um, a membrane that is wound into like a spiral. So you have a flat sheet and then you roll it up and then you, you um, pop the, um, the spiral into the metal housings that you, that you can see here. And this unit can carry two of these housings. And then you have another system that is also very popular in industry could, is uh, the flat sheet membrane um, that you can see here. So this is literally like a, a series of flat sheets. And then you have the cassette type, type system. And I believe, Doc, this is what you guys have in the, in the lab, right? That's correct. It's cassette. Do you have the 0.5 or 0.1 or even smaller? It looks like a 0.1. Right. Okay. That's what I thought. Cool. So um, there are different geometries and different materials, um, but the working principle on a high level is very similar. And um, how does it work? So here, this is um, the diagram. So you have on the top, this is basically, um, yeah, upstream or like um, before the, the membrane cutoff, you have your feed, which in this case is supinated and it has a bunch of crap in it, salts, um, proteins, some cells, uh, but also obviously your target proteins and the target proteins are 20 kilodalton in size and your we chose the membrane cutoff to be at 10 kilodaltons and maybe let's say there was a preliminary experiment where we tested different membrane types different membrane cutoffs and um, we let's say we compared 5 kilodalton and 10 kilodalton with the same membrane material and then we did, we ran some tests and we realized like, okay, hey, we can actually get away with a 10 kilo doll membrane and it will retain the cell and the, um, the proteins almost as well as the five kilo doll. So let's say there's only like 2% difference in terms of um, retention capacity, but then the, the flow rate, the flux is much, much higher. So we're like, okay, we want to, we can't afford spending like three days dial, like fil filtering this material we want to get rid we want to get done in um, half a day so that's why we we chose the 10 kilo dalton membrane even though there's some sort of transmission so every once in a while um we have your protein runs through this the pores and it basically goes into the permeate stream that is lost um so basically it works how this works you have feed material that uh, runs across the membrane, your proteins are being uh, repelled or retained. They can pass through the membrane and then salts, water and other things go as permeate out and we collect the streams, the retentate goes back into the feed and the permeate goes out and leaves the system. And um, so the, the tangential flow filtration has an advantage because it has a self cleaning effect because the feed flow runs across the membrane and takes away a, a big chunk of the fouling of the solids that would otherwise um, yeah, accumulate on, on the membrane surface. And um, even though it has a self-cleaning effect, there's always flux decrease when you run tangential flow filtration. So there's a chart here um, where you can see the flux in the beginning of the processing, of the process is very high. And then as you generate, as you process more material, your, um, your flux will go down by here after two hours, uh, 1.5 hours, you can even see the flux decrease by 4x. Um, and if you ran like a dead end filtration where you don't have this um, cleaning effect, you would probably, um, yeah, won't be able to process any material after one or two hours because there's no cleaning effect. It just the, 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 the pores would plug up. Um, so yeah, bottom line, you will have some fouling in TFF, but it's much less compared to a dead end filtration. So this is actually the reason why people like the tangential flow filtration. Um, yeah, because the fouling is less. Nonetheless, you have fouling. This leads to longer processing times. And sometimes if you do it wrong or if the fouling is too severe, then even in TFF, you will have irreversible blockage. And then you have to stop the run. You have to run a caustic, like a CIP solution. Um, high pH and high temperature and just do some like cleaning cycles. This takes another one or two hours 
And um, this is something that you really don't want. Um, real quick, the cassette filtration is um, very great for ultra filtration. Um, the throughput is fairly low if you compare to spiral membrane filtration. And this is because the surface area of the, um, the membrane is actually fairly low. In this case, it's 0.5 um, square meters. The feed pressure is also relatively low. So if you could run this at 10 bar, for example, then you could force more protein, more uh, material through with it because the driving force is higher and the throughput would be higher as well. But then the, the, uh, the cassette membranes are not designed to, um, yeah, to withstand very high pressures. Um, so take away um, the cassette units. It, they're very great for laboratory scale. They're very easy to use. You don't have to worry about pressures too much. And that's one of the reasons why dark and why you guys have this in the lab. However, if you go to large scale, you would probably want to use like a spiral membrane filtration system, something where you see here, because the, um, the surface area is actually higher, you can run it higher um, feed pressure and the throughput is higher. And also um, you can run this in the um, microfiltration, ultra filtration, nano filtration, or even reverse osmosis setup. So it's more versatile than the cassettes. Um, but what I was saying earlier, the, um, the working principle is very similar. Um, but yeah, it's very popular in industry because it's highly scalable. You can run one unit or two units or maybe like a whole wall with like 100 of these membranes. You can um, yeah, switch them out. You can easily um, put in another membrane with a larger uh, pore size and the throughput is very high and you can also automate the cleaning. So at large scale, people just press two buttons and they get um, cleaned overnight with nobody um, needs to be in, in, in the lab to do it. So uh, another reason why people like the spiral membrane so much. Um, how does the spiral work, the, the flow path? So here you have the spiral unit, you have the feed coming in from one side and then on the other side, you have um, two streams coming out one is the permeate stream and this is the yellow and then you have the retentane stream in red. And if you unwind the, the unit, um, the spiral, then you can see those are just flat sheets. And then the feed comes through, um, the permeate goes actually through the membrane. It goes down into the um, permeate collection tube in the middle and then it leaves the system. It goes into one collection vessel. And these are the, the particles that are smaller than the membrane, like salts, small proteins and maybe some yeah, other impurities. And then the retentate, um, these are particles that are larger than the pores. They are being rejected from the membrane. They just yeah, slide off and they are being collected um, in another vessel. Um, this is the flow diagram of the TFF, the protein concentration. You have your feed holding tank with 190 liters you, um, this is the material that we got from the disk stack. You run it through the TFF system and then the retentate goes back into the holding tank. And this is basically your cycling, your proteins with some uh, carrying liquid, I will call it, you just cycle it uh, back. And then you have the permeate that goes, that leaves the system, um, which yeah, again, has the particles that are smaller than the membrane cutoff. And this is, this goes to waste. Um, and by doing that, your feed volume decreases. And because of that, because you're retaining the proteins, your protein concentration goes up. So in the beginning, you have a high volume, 190 liters. And at the end, we have, let's say, 19 liters. And then you have a concentration factor of 10. And this is the setup, how it looks at the APDU. We have the holding tank, then we have our yellow pump. This is our uh, TFF cassette system, which works identically to um, your system that you have, the point 0.1. Um, actually, we have both in our lab, but uh, since we have a lot of material, we're using the point 0.5 square meter here. But um, we could use the point 0.1, it would just take longer. And then you have the permit, which goes out from the other side of the, of the module and it collected in the waste drum. Um, now we do the mass balance. Um, we started off with 190 kilograms or 3.8 kilograms of proteins. We concentrated it down to 19 kilograms and we have 171 kilograms of waste. 
And um, during this process, again, we had losses. We lost, in fact, 13.1% uh, because we um, measured the, the protein concentra concentration in the 19 liters. And we got, we expected um, 200 grams per liter, but we only were able to find or to measure 175 grams per liter. So now the question is, where's the missing protein? And um, every time you, you run unit operation in DSP, you want to make sure that actually the separation worked out well, because um, let's say if there was a leak in the membrane, and then you would not be able to concentrate any protein and the entire protein would maybe, um, or half would go into the supernatant, half would go like in the permeate, sorry, or half would be into the retentate. So you always want to measure the concentrations in all fractions that you have, the starting material, the permeate and the retentate. So in this case, we measured the protein concentration in, um, in the permeate and we got, we expected zero or like ideally would have gotten zero, but in fact, we got 2.1 grams per liter in the quote unquote waste stream. And if we multiply this by uh, 171 kilograms, then there we go, we, we lost 0.36 kilograms. And then also during um, the setup and the breakdown of the unit operations, um, there were some spills and then maybe there were some leftovers in the tubings. Some proteins were actually stuck on the membrane or inside the membrane in the pores. So there we go. This is where our protein went. And we got some losses. Um, now we have the 19 liter solution with 3.3 kilograms of protein. But then I mentioned there was also other stuff in it. There might be um, there's still some salts, there's still some, maybe some small proteins, stuff that you want to get rid of. And then the next unit operation would be to um, purify this stream more. So um, one of the, um, the goals here is the next unit operation is to remove the salts from the concentrated protein solution. Um, and salts, the salt concentration we can measure by conductivity. So you don't have to worry about like um, remember, remembering these numbers, but we started off with 10 milli Siemens per centimeter, and we want to reduce the conductivity down to 0.5. And now the question is, how do we do that? Um, again, we can use the TFF system, um, but instead of concentrating down the solution, meaning instead of like um, reducing the volume further, we, um, we are still pulling out the supernatant, uh, the, sorry, the permeate, but then at the same time, we are feeding in low salt, the eye water into the, into the carboy. So um, we are removing stuff, salts, and um, we are retaining the proteins and we are replenishing the volume that we are losing through low salt, the eye water. And this is the setup that you can see on the top right. Um, and then this is the approach. We keep the volume constant, we keep the, the, uh, the concentration constant, and we keep the mass of the protein constant. And basically all what we're doing is we are replacing some of the um, salt rich buffer with the low salt buffer. And um, this is called diafiltration. And um, yeah, so basically this is what I just mentioned. The deionized water, de water has very low salt. It's like 55 nano siemens per centimeter. And as we're adding this, the salt concentration decreases. And this is what you can see on the, on the chart on the right. Um, so this is normalized concentration. So one is our starting concentration. And then once we're adding um, more water, um, the, the concentration reduces. And um, we, we can say, how long are we doing this, right? Then we have to, um, there's this one uh, parameter that we can define, which is at one diafiltration volume. And one diafiltration volume is actually the starting volume, in this case, 19 liter. So once we added 19 liter of dia of the eye water, we did one diafiltration volume. And as you can see here on the chart, um, two, four, six, eight, 10 diafiltration, the uh, concentration of salt goes way down. But then you can see after um, five diafiltration volumes where I put this um, black mark here, it's almost as good, the concentration is almost as low as if you were doing 10 diafiltration volumes. So um, in industry, it's pretty standard to do four to five 
die filtration volumes because afterwards you have diminishing returns. You will probably just add more water, but the washing out effect is less and less, and you're just generating more and more waste that you have to deal with. And then, um, yeah, you have to also worry about waste disposal, and this is expensive again. So it's always good to make that good trade off. And industry found that four to five die filtration volumes is usually um, the way to go. Um, so how does this setup now change to um, the setup that we had earlier for the ultra filtration for the um, concentration? So again, we have this part is the same. We have the feed holding tank, or in this case, our carboy. Uh, we have the TFF. We recycle the proteins back into the um, feed holding tank. And now and we are also removing permeate, right? And now we also add um, on the left, you see this purple arrow here indicates that we have a flow of DI water in low salt, low conductivity. And um, this is the equation here, feed volume is constant, protein is constant, and the conductivity goes down. This is the setup in the lab. This is the concentration setup. And now with the, um, with the second pump and the DI water reservoir, this becomes now the diafiltration setup. Uh, after the run, again, we do a mass balance. Um, we started off with 19 kilograms of material, 3.3 kilograms of protein. We recovered concentrate, um, the retentate, again, same volume, 19 kilograms. And we generated five times, like five diafiltration volumes of waste, which is about 100. Um, so our material is still in the same cowboy, nothing visibly has changed, but it's measurably no lower salt. And again, we had some losses, 8.6%. How did we know that? Again, we measured the protein titer in um, the retentate. Um, instead of 175, we got 150 grams per liter. So um, eventually here we got up, we got 2.85 kilograms of protein that we can actually recover. And again, same sources of protein, like where we, we missed it, doing a transfer stuck on the membrane. Um, and some protein actually, again, went through the membrane. Um, okay, so this is the, um, the metric that we had before we started the, the DSP process. 20 grams per liter of protein. We got 280 kilograms of broth. Um, we got it down to 190 kilograms of supernatant. So in theory, 3.8 kilograms were um, we were recoverable. After the DSP, we, um, we brought down the supernatant to a low salt concentrated protein solution of 19 kilograms. And the protein titer is 150 grams per liter. And if you do the math, then you come to um, 2.85 kilograms of proteins. And this is a 75% recovery. And the good news here, we, um, the, the target was one kilogram. So um, we are almost there. We will probably have another drying step, either a spray dryer or um, we do some uh, lyophilization, freeze drying. Um, and we will, again, have some losses, probably in the range of like 70 to 90% recovery. But um, yeah, the good news is the one kilogram target is still within reach. And um, yeah, in this project, everything went really well, no major hiccups. Um, and this is what I wanted to tell you. Do you have questions? <laughs>